in quite a few verses today, so it's a good day to have your Bible. Since you have it every day, that's good. Matthew chapter 5, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you've spoken to us already and showing us your heart, your compassion, your mercy, and your zeal for us, your zeal to rid us of anything that would hinder us, your passion to get rid of sin from us, your passion to show us who we are without you, your passion to expose all of those things around us that we start to rely on, that prevent us from pressing on into you. Do that some more now, Lord, I pray. I want it with all of my heart. As you've done it, I've been afraid at first, but I've seen what it's done for me as you've removed those crutches and shown me that I don't need to rely on those crutches anymore. You're giving me resurrection power, life in my legs that I don't need those crutches for anymore that I've depended on for so long on this earth. Give us life, Lord, we pray, so that we won't lean ever on the things of this earth, that nothing on this earth will be a crutch. We forsake and we cast off those things that for years have been our crutch and prevented us from seeing the power of the life in Jesus Christ. We want that afresh. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray, fill me also, Lord, as I share the thoughts you've laid on my heart. Guide every word. Let me speak as if standing in your very presence, Lord, and as your spokesperson, as the, as the one entrusted in this case right now to feed your flock as you have fed me. And feed me too, Lord, I pray. I acknowledge my emptiness and my need before you even as I stand here. Thank you that you're a faithful God. You're a faithful shepherd. You have plenty of food for any of us that ask. Your well never runs dry. That spring that we, come, we seek to come to now never runs dry. We thirst, Lord. We thirst. We hunger and thirst for this. Thank you. It's a reality of life you've promised us to. You're going to take us to new heights of our relationship with you and our relationship with each other here in this church, our relationship with people outside of this church as well. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I've been thinking as I meditated on this verse, as we go on to that next slide, what the mark of true Christianity is. I think a lot of, I've been, maybe it's been coming out in some of our messages as well. It's easy for us to think that because our church name has Christian in it, or because we pray to Jesus as opposed to any of the other false gods that are, because we say in Jesus' name after our prayers, because we read a Bible, that therefore we are true Christians. Those are all important. We pray to Jesus. He is the only true God. This is the only book that is God's Word. And we are Christians. That's a name that they were called all the way back in the first century. And that's why we choose to have that name as well. It means we're married to Christ. But I've been seeing more and more that there are identifying marks of Christianity in God's Word. In the words that Jesus said, for instance, and the words that the apostles taught their disciples in the early church, that should prove to us that we are His disciples and they are, we are really true Christians. Here is one of those. In Matthew chapter 5, you read in verse 45. Matthew 5 verse 45. In order that you may be, or my margin says, expands on that, in order that you may show yourself to be. In other words, in, in, in order that people around you the world, your fellow Christians, your wife, your husband, your children, in order that you may show yourself to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. In order that you may show yourselves to be sons of, of your Father who is in heaven. So, what is he talking about? What is it that we do that when people look at that, they say, wow, that's a son of a Father in heaven. That's a son of God. That's a son of the true God. What is it? Verse 43. We'll back up. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is what they were entitled to do in the Old Testament. It was okay for them to hate their enemies and love their, as long as they love their neighbors. That was good. But I say to you, now if you're a Christian, this is a mark of Christianity, not a mark of Judaism and the old, old covenant. 
This is a mark of Christianity, that we are followers of Jesus. I say to you, Jesus said, because Jesus is bringing a new thing. He says, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you in order that you may show yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. What I see Jesus saying here is, anybody can love their friends. Everybody love their friends. If you're looking at the characteristics that distinguish those who are sons of the living God and those who are sons of the other, because I think there are only two lineages in the world today. There are two families. There are two spiritual families. There's not multiple, just two. There are multiple religions, but ultimately you can characterize them in two categories. One a very big category and the other a very small category. The big category is those that are of the family of Adam, whose father is the devil. Jesus said that to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. So that we know that the devil is in the business of fathering spiritually children on this earth. And the entire world that forsakes Christ is in this family. And it's the, it's the bigger of the two families. We know that. It's a broad way, Jesus called it. And the narrow way, the small family, it's got a few members, relatively, is the family of Jesus whose father is God. And here Jesus is very clear, unequivocally clear, about what is the characteristic. He says, you might, he doesn't say, well, you'll pray in my name or any of these other things that we're taught to do. The mark to the world around us is, man, these guys even love their enemies. They must be sons of the Father, of God, Father in heaven. Because anybody can love their friends. Anybody can love the people in their own club. Anybody can love the people that they get along with and they, uh, they like hanging out with those, those people. Anybody can do that. Even the worldly people do that. You go to any church, you go to any temple, you go to any mosque, you go to any company, go to any club, they all love their kind. The mark of Christianity is we don't just love our kind, we love our enemies. I love the man who is doing me harm. I love the person whom I'm suspicious about. I love that person who is treating me in a way that I don't understand. I love when I don't have a reason to love because I am a Christian. These are the two families. Now, we can find all other reasons and say, well, I said the prayer and all that. I believe that Jesus, I believe Jesus had his word when he says, if you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, then that's a mark that you are a son of your Father in heaven. So it is when we love those who see things differently from us, is how I've worded it there. It is when we love those who see things differently from us, because I think this word enemies can trip us up. I think if I say enemies, I think, well, I don't really have enemies. Yeah, you know, I, I really don't have any enemies. But if you ask me, do I have people who see things differently from me? And, and maybe they're important things for me. They're convictions, maybe they're issues that are big for me. But I see it a little bit differently. Now, I think that's the person who is my enemy, potentially. That's the person who it could become an issue of conflict. I'm not going to pick up my fist and fight at him. Maybe that's just not my personality to do it. But it's the person who sees things differently from me, perhaps in your own home, like your husband or your wife. Like perhaps in the same church that you attend. Perhaps in the workplace. And it's this person who just somehow, whatever perspective you have, they seem to have exactly the opposite. I'm sure you have those people in your life. It's just no matter what, you, they somehow have the opposite perspective. They're always there. And I believe God places them in our life very intentionally to balance us out, to, sh to get us to prove to this world that we are true Christians. If it wasn't for these enemies, these people who saw things differently from me, I would never have the test. I could go on fooling myself that I really have the love of Christ and I'm a part of God's family. But the moment I'm faced with this situation, with this person who sees things differently from me, now all of a sudden I have this test. Which family are you a part of? Are you going to prove that you're one of the sons of your heavenly father? So it is when we love those who see things differently from us that we prove ourselves to be sons and daughters of our heavenly father. He goes on to say, why? Because the middle of verse 45, he causes, this is the proof. In other words, you look at my, look at my son, Zave. If you guys have seen pictures of me when I was a kid, you'll know that he's my son because he looks like me. I mean, even now we have that resemblance. And my, my family, there's, my children have that resemblance to daddy and mommy. There's that resemblance. So what Jesus is saying here is you will prove that resemblance to your father 
in your love for your enemies and those who and praying for those who persecute you why because that's what your father is like he verse 45 causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous in other words this um, evil person one one night before he goes to bed curses God and says ah God I'm an atheist I don't believe in God do you expect the next morning that all of a sudden his house is going to be in darkness and there's sun shining all the way around him. And because this guy cursed God, God says, really, you said that about me? Fine, no sun for you tomorrow. Or this unrighteous person who is unfaithful and dishonoring to God with his life, God says, fine, no rain for you tomorrow. I'm going to let it rain all around you, but not right there. He did that in the case of the Egyptians. You read that sometimes. But that's not how he operates today. But you know, if we look at our lives and we look at our attitudes, and if I look at Christendom around me, and this is not to point a finger at people, but to recognize that tendency in my own flesh. I see that that is how I tend to treat other people. Somebody says something to me, and I say, fine, my sun's not going to shine on you tomorrow. No rain for you from now on because you said that about me, or you looked at me that way, or you treated me that way. Isn't that how Christendom, people that call themselves Christians, that think that they are part of that family. I know because I was one of that too, until the Lord showed me. How do I prove that I'm one of his children? Is that my son shines on my enemies and my friends. And then he goes on to say in verse 46, because if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the people of this other family, the children of the devil, do the same thing? That's who the tax gatherers are. Don't even the, the people of this other family do the same thing? They all love their enemies if you only love your friends, those who love you. Or if you greet only those who greet you, if you only greet your brothers, only greet the people that you're closest to, what do you do more than this other family? Even the Gentiles do the same. Then he says this verse 48, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we looked at that a few weeks ago in the context of mercy, how we ought to be perfect in mercy. That's the standard. And maybe you're born again, or maybe you're hearing this for the first time and realizing, wow, I better check my own attitude. I better check my own heart and see which family I'm a, am I a part of. Who is my father? Is my father the devil? And it's demonstrated in the fact that if you're nice to me, I'll nice to you. And if you're not nice to me, I'm going to get back at you somehow. I'm going to gossip about you. Or I'm going to spread this evil rumor about you. Or I'm going to just look at you funny and not spend time with you. I, I found myself having to check my attitude and check my motive and see which family am I a part of. Therefore, you are to be perfect. In, in that impartiality, that perfectness in impartiality is our standard as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, maybe we won't get there overnight. I'm not there, certainly. I can't say that when people speak evil of me or do something evil to me, that my response is just the same as those who are nice to me. I'm not there yet, but I've set my goal because I take God's Word seriously. I take Jesus' Word seriously. I want to be perfect. Part of my transformation into the image of Jesus is that by the time Jesus comes, whenever he comes, or I, whenever I meet him face to face, if I die first, that's fine. If he returns, that's the day I'm looking forward to. When I see him face to face, I want to have completed this journey of being impartial and perfect in how I treat others, my enemies and my friends. Now, we could just say, well, that's impossible. There's no way to do that. It will be for the person who says it is impossible, it'll be that. And one day we'll get to eternity and realize that Jesus had a way that I could have walked on in which he, have, he would have completed this perfect work of making me perfect in how I treat others, my enemies and my friends, and I just missed it. I don't know what the eternal destiny of such a person is, but I do know that Jesus said, if I'm going to prove that I'm a child of the living God, it is evident in how I treat my enemies, plain and simple. How I treat that, and who are my enemies? I just said that. It is those who see things a little bit differently from me. The characteristics of the two lineages. Let's, let's look at this verse in Philippians chapter 2. It's interesting that in the context of this peace and strife, we're looking at peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And I'm actually going to use a term that I prefer, peace pursuers. Because I find that more often than not, when the Bible talks about peace in the context of the New Testament, it's, it's presented as a prize, as a finishing line, like pursue it, run after it. Don't just be slack and like, okay, some, someday I'll, I'll work out peace with that person with whom I'm, conflict, I'm having conflict. Pursue it. 
Stay up at night and pray for that person. Uh, do whatever it must be. I'm not talking about work, sure, but I'm talking about this pursuit, like the Olympians pursue the gold medal. They're not, they're, I mean, if they can go a little bit faster down the ski slope, they're going to go a little bit faster down the ski slope because they want to win. And it's that mentality, it's that spirit in which peace is presented in the New Testament. And that's how we must be pursuing it, peace with all men. So in Philippians 2 verse 14, he says, Do all things without grumbling or fighting, disputing, strife. Different translations use different words for that, uh, or complaining. But essentially that word that disputing is strife. Do all things without this strife mentality. When it says all things, how many things are excluded from that? None. You know, when it says all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to His purpose. That's Romans 8. 28. I love to think that that means everything, all things. Nothing's excluded from that. Yes, Lord, everything I'm going through is now for my very best because I love you and I'm called according to your purpose. Now here's another all things from which nothing is excluded. Do all things without grumbling or fighting. That means I'm not entitled to have a fight with even one person over one thing. My husband, my wife, my friend, my neighbor, my brother, my sister, my child, my parents, my extended family, it doesn't matter. There is no exclusion. There is no exception to the case. Do all things without grumbling or complaining and or disputing. Why? So that, here's the same phrase, so that you may show yourself to be, you may prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God. There's the two families again. The children of God are proven as blameless and innocent uh, because they do everything without grumbling and fighting. If you see somebody fighting, in other words, what I believe Jesus and the Holy Spirit is saying here is, if you see somebody fighting, you know which family they're a part of. If you see somebody refusing to fight, refusing to take up the sword, refusing to get back at that person who has done something, some harm to them, you know this is a blameless and innocent child of God above reproach in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation where there's most of the people are part of this big family. That's Philippians 2 verse 15. So the children of the devil, this big family, are characterized by strife. The children of, this, of, of the living God, let me show you another verse in Romans chapter 12. This is the characteristic now of this small family. It's a very small family. I really believe with all my heart. That's why Jesus said it's a narrow way. Very few people, I don't know what the percentage is, Jesus never gives us that, but he says it's small, it's a minute percentage of people living in, uh, uh, who claim to be born again, living in uh, and attending churches that preach God's word and, and are seeking to be a living expression of the body of Christ. Maybe even in those churches, the percentage of people that really take this word seriously is very small. This is the characteristic of the sons and the daughters of God. Romans 12 verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. There's that all again. There's no exception. I'm, as much as it lies with me, if possible, be at peace with all men. In other words, what Jesus says, what I understand this to mean is, if there's a gap between you and that other person, you build a bridge. You make sure that you've done your part in building the bridge to bring reconciliation. And this really tails very well off, off, uh, off of Phil's message last week, that we have been given this ministry of reconciliation. It's, it's, our, it's our mission on this earth. We are missionaries carrying this, mis this message of reconciliation. That means I'm in the business of building bridges, restoring re relationships, and bringing reconciliation now. At that point, if I've made sure that I built the bridge and they refuse to walk on it, then then uh, Paul here says to the Romans, well, you've done your part. And there, there, it's, under, it's understood that this is a two-way street. It may take both people going, uh, being able to go both ways for there to truly be that. But if possible, as far as it depends on you, have you done your part to build the bridge? That's what Paul is saying here. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying here. So the characteristic of the children of the devil is their strife. They stand there on the bridge and says, well, let me see him at least come halfway. I'll meet him halfway. That's not what I see God giving us uh, an excuse for. He's not, he doesn't call us to, to meet people halfway, to build half the bridge and let them build half the bridge. He says, you do whatever. Make sure that the pathway is complete for reconciliation, for that ministry of reconciliation. If they choose not to walk down that bridge, that's fine. You've done your part. Your conscience can be clear. You know, Tertullius, Tertullian was a... Uh, 
was a man, I have that quote from him on the next slide, Tertullian was a man who lived in the second century, uh, late second, early third century AD. And he made this quote, which was, has stuck with me. I remember, I remember hearing it as a kid when I was growing up in India, and it, it, I've never forgotten it. And I did, looked it up again so I could put it on there, uh, on that next slide, uh, Josh, if you have the next slide. The, this is the mark of Christians. You know, we're talking about the mark of Christianity. The mark of Christianity, he, Tertullian said this, the pagans must be able to say about Christians this, see how they love one another. For the pagans themselves are animated by mutual hatred. And, continuing the quote, how they are ready even to die for each other. Because the pagans themselves would sooner put each other to death. So, let me explain that quote a little bit. This is what he was saying. He says, I believe that this must be the mark of true Christianity, that the world looks at those Christians and thinks, man, they love each other, and they're willing to die for each other. they got to be Christians. Look at how far Christianity has come now over 2,000 years. Not even to, about a little less than that. But look at how far it's come where now you look at, you don't like, you don't, you're not surprised when you hear about divorce and, re, and church and uh, church splits and, uh, and uh, uh, just animosity and churches fighting with each other and they're, they're breaking away from this conference and then there's uh, churches suing each other and members in the church suing each other and all this stuff. How far we have come from what Tertullian saw, and not, it's not just his idea. I think he just reworded what we have been looking at in God's Word. That this is God's will for us. This is, in fact, what Jesus meant when he said, they will know you are Christians. They'll be like, got to be a Christian, because he loves so much. Got to be a Christian. He's willing to die for his brother, not just his friend, that enemy, that person who's taken advantage of him, it, it's got to be something about them. It's, they've got to be followers of Jesus because that's what Jesus did. When Jesus hung on the cross and his enemies were hurling abuse at him, he said, Father, forgive them. And it was for those same, same people. I, you know, I thought about this often. Imagine if Jesus got to heaven and while he's there, he's looking down at one of these Pharisees coming to faith in him. Who, one of these same Pharisees who put him to the cross, maybe Ananias or, uh, no, Annas or Caiaphas, one of those guys, I don't know if they did, we don't know anything about their history after they put Jesus to death, but imagine, let's say, that one of these guys, Caiaphas, after Jesus is resurrected, somehow he comes to a place of, man, I, I, this must have been the living God, and he starts to put his faith in Jesus. What would Jesus' reaction have been? I think he would have been excited. And he would have been like, I mean, even as he's dying, let's say Caiaphas comes up there and, and Jesus sees the look on his face and says, Caiaphas is going to believe. And the reason I'm hanging here is because he put me here. But he's turning to God. Yes, this is the spirit of Christ. This is the sign that we are becoming more like Jesus, that when people do harm to us, and then God, it goes well with them. Maybe, maybe they don't get the punishment that we're expecting them to get for the harm they've done to us. And it goes well with them. And they become more spiritual. And they, they come in repentance. And, and there's excitement. And the father throws a party for this younger brother of mine who treated me badly while he was here in the house. Will you join the party or not? See, I wonder if the older brother had some resentment towards the younger brother. While the younger brother was in the home, maybe he teased him, maybe... He was jealous, certainly, that the younger brother got away with all this squandering of the wealth, and the older brother didn't get to do that. And I think there was some of that inside. And here's this younger brother. Part of what he now, you know, you, if you look at the inheritance, I think of it like this. Here was the inheritance split in two, and the younger son goes and blows it. Now this other half, the older brother, has to split with the younger brother again. Now he gets a quarter. He gets a quarter. He was entitled to a half, the older brother. Now he gets a quarter because he's got to split the other half of that with his younger brother. That's why he doesn't want to come in the house. And I think of so, so much of this older brother mentality that says, man, I can't forgive that person. I can't let that go. I'm holding on to that. See how they love one another and see how they're ready to die for each other. Turn over a couple pages to Romans chapter 14. Paul talks here about on that next slide, Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. Romans 14 verse 19, he says this, So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up for one another. In other words, if you have an opportunity to say something, if you have an opportunity to say something or do something, pursue that which will make for peace and build someone up. 
I, I'll be honest with you, my dear brothers and sisters, I've been really convicted about this recently. How easy it is for things to come out of my mouth that just put down others. It just, it's not mean, it's not mean-spirited. I'm not trying to be feisty or anything like that. I just somehow feel better sometimes when I can put somebody else down. It's the spirit in the world. You know, when you can dunk on top of the other guy and, you know, posterize him like they say, you feel good about yourself. Look at, ha ha, look at you. You know, here I am on top of you. That's the spirit in the world. That's the spirit of this big family. But the spirit of, of, the, of the children, of the, of the son of, of, of God, of the living God is this. That I, I'm not looking to one-up somebody else. I'm not looking to put down somebody else and make them feel any smaller. Look at what he says here. Pursue the things which make for peace and building up. And I've been trying to make a conscious effort to catch myself before I say it. That thing which will somehow make somebody else feel a little bit smaller, a little bit like unworthy or a little bit less. Because it doesn't build up. If I can't say that thing which will pursue peace and build up, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to, in fact, find the root in my heart, perhaps that root of bitterness, and get rid of that. So that what comes out of me, out of my life, out of my heart, is things that build up pursuing peace. He says here in verse 16, then, this is, this is one of those things, and it's interesting the context, and we'll look at the context that he's talking about here. But he says here in verse 16, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. And this is when good becomes evil. In other words, I might have something good for me and something that works for me and it's good for me, but it can become something evil if that becomes a source of a rift, of a division, of a gap between me and, and my brother, me and my sister, me and my husband, me and my wife, me and that relative of mine, me and my neighbor, me and my coworker. If that which is good that I hold on to and I'm proud of and excited about and I stand on perhaps a conviction, when that becomes the issue that I stand on and there's this other person and because of this issue that is good, I allow it to bring a lack of peace between me and my brother. That's what he's saying here. Do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. So what's he talking about? Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the, of the chapter. He says, now, accept the one, verse 1, accept the one who is weak in faith. Please follow along. We're probably going to read through this whole chapter, so pay attention very carefully to what he's saying and let the Holy Spirit bring these words as he has written them in God's Word, alive and personal to you. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that he may eat all things. He's talking about something as practical as what we eat. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Okay. So, that's, that's fine. Now, it's fine that the one person only eats vegetables and the other person can eat anything he wants. But the problem is, verse 3, let not him who eats everything regard with contempt him who does not eat everything. Neither let him who does not eat everything judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Okay, he says in verse 4, listen, for who are you to judge the servant of another? Remember, this is somebody else's employee. This is somebody else's child. This is somebody else's servant. Imagine if I went to some company down the street and started telling the employees how, if I went to, to, the, to the Ashes store, let's say, and started telling everybody, hey, you guys need to be doing this more, or need to be doing that more. Reuben would kick me out pretty quickly. He'd say, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's not your store. And he would have every right to. Why? Because it's not my store. And that's exactly what he's saying is, who are you to judge the servant of another? He is answerable to his master. His master will take care of any issue that he has to take care of. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. And stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Here I am I judging him because of this or because of that. And he just uses food as an example. Now in the case of the Romans, it was a real issue. It was food. It was like they judged each other because some felt we can eat everything. Others felt, no, we can't really eat anything. And they made it spiritual somehow. They somehow convinced themselves that this conviction that I have is not. And Paul was saying, no, it's not. It's an earthly thing. It's food. And we'll continue reading. But he says that God is able to make this servant stand or fall. It's up to God. You're not going to make him stand or fall by getting him to line up with your conviction. Verse 5. One man, okay, the other issue was this day, regarding one day as above another. One man regards one day above another. Let's say Sunday. Another regards every day alike. One man has no problem playing sports on a Sunday. The other is like, ah, I can't play on Sunday. Any other day I'll come, fine. Or one man has a problem playing sports, period. 
Whatever the issue is. It says another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord. The key thing is that you're doing it for the Lord. Anything that you do, whether it's an earthly conviction, whether it's the way you live your life, it's whether you, the way you bring up your children, whether you homeschool them, public school them, uh, private school them, whether you don't school them at all, if you're doing it for the Lord, let each man be fully convinced. He who observes, he who does any of these things, observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat. And gives thanks to the God to God so who am I to judge the person who eats and the person who doesn't eat because they're giving thanks to God in their life let them live let them give thanks to God in the way that they live their life for not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself for if we live we live for the Lord if we die we die for the Lord if in my eating or in my not eating I live it's for the Lord if I die it's for the Lord if in my observing Sunday or not observing Sunday I live it's for the Lord if I die it's for the Lord and I mean, imagine, let's say, um, I thought about this too as I was just thinking, you know, reading through this chapter. Let's say I have a conviction that I shouldn't play sports on Sunday. Let's just, let's just say for hy hypothetically that I, that I have that conviction. And then I find out that certain groups of people went and played on a Sunday and they got hurt. What's going to happen in my heart <laughs> if I find out that this person who has a conviction, he, he doesn't have my conviction. I think, man, how dare he play on a Sunday? And sure enough, he goes and breaks his leg playing a baseball or a basketball or something, I think serves him right. You know, he should have had my conviction. That's what he's talking about here. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. And this is where I think he gets to the heart of the issue. He says, you guys make so much about these things. Don't you realize that Christ lived and died for you to not have to deal with these kinds of issues? If you were in the Old Testament, sure. You have all kinds of rules, like you better not eat shrimp, and you better not eat any of those mussels, and uh, don't, no pig, and uh, you be careful how you kill the animal, and all that stuff. But he says, Christ lived and died. And do we see that we, we neglect and lose the value of what Christ died to accomplish when we make these things such big things? If we, uh, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? Whichever side you're on. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord. I live. You guys are just dirt and dust with a vapor that comes out of your breath. And you'll be gone in a minute. I live. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And that's the problem is that when I get somebody else to try to line up with my conviction, what I'm trying to get him to do is to bow to me. And God says, listen, you're never going to be on that throne. Every knee will bow to me as I live. I will be standing here after you're sitting here on my throne after you're dead and gone, God says. You who think so much of your conviction, so much of yourself and how you've got it all right and got it all figured out. Okay. And every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. Remember, we, we all live or die for the Lord. And then he goes on to say, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an... Oh, this is... Just listen carefully. Let us determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Don't put that stumbling block in there. Don't, don't say something that will trip them up. I mean, they've already got the devil gunning for them. They've already got their enemies in this world, the spiritual forces of darkness gunning for them. Why would you and I add to that by putting an obstacle in their path, trying to get them to trip up, to make them feel small? Why would I say that thing? And again, I'll be honest, brothers I, I, and sisters, I, I'm really convicted about this, how in my nature it's so easy to put down other people and just... Just put them down and just make a, you know, and it's done jokingly. It's done frivolously. I'm speaking to myself 100% here. It's just done in a way that's just casual and frivolous. And, but it's, there's an element of truth. You know, it says, um, uh, many a truth is spoken in jest. And I, I kind of slide it off by making a joke out of it. But I know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make that person feel small. And the Lord has just peeled back the covers and showed me what it is in the light of this verse. 
Therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this. Make this your determination for 2014, that you and I, and especially for us in the context of this church, in the context of our families, in the context of our workplaces, that we will never, never put an obstacle in my brother or my sister's way. Never. Could you imagine what we will be as a church, what we will be in our homes, in our marriages? If I say I could put that obstacle and feel good about myself, making them feel small, but it will trip them up. Here's my wife trying to make it on her spiritual journey, and here I am just making her feel small about that thing she did. Or here's my brother trying to make it in his spiritual journey, and I make him feel small for something he did and the way he did it, and, and just despising him that way. Determine this. Never. I've got to find my place here. There it is, 13. Determine this not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Paul says, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt. I mean, something as trivial as food. And what Paul is saying is, would you really let food or this observance of a particular day or this thing that you're so firmly uh, entrenched in, would you let that call, be a cause of hurt for your brother? If because of, put whatever it is there. If because of this thing your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food, or whatever the issue is, him for whom Christ died. Do you see the seriousness of this? That Christ died to ransom that brother, that soul, that sister, that child, and because of my being firmly entrenched in this issue, I destroy that person whom Christ died, that he might live. Do not destroy with your food or your observance of your day or whatever, him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing. Now, Paul's not saying that you should therefore change your position or change this and change your life or anything like that. No, it's good for you. That's great. But don't expect somebody else to hold to that. And don't judge them because they refuse that. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. In other words, this wicked and perverse generation looks and think, wow, they let something. I mean, you know, at eternity, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, my dad would always say this. He says, would it matter 2,000 years from now? We hated that because we were usually trying to get him to side with us that uh, I was right and the other, my brother was wrong and I should have scored two points and, uh, you know, it's usually something like that. And then dad's answer was always, will it matter 2,000 years from now? I understand now because I use that on my kids. <laughs> Um, but this is at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll look back and realize, really? I made that trivial little thing an issue? That I allowed a separation between me and my wife, and me and my husband, me and my brother, me and my sister, or that relative or whatever? I made that small thing, and there will be such regret, I think, if we stand there and see these little trivial things that have faded away and vaporized in a moment as I kneel before this God who says, as I live, every knee will bow. And I think, Lord... Why did I let that? The most important thing was peace. The most important thing was righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I allowed this thing to steal that from me. For the kingdom of God, he says in verse 17, is not eating and drinking. You might be proud of it. You might be embarrassed about it. doesn't matter. But it's not either of those things. So don't be proud and don't be embarrassed. It is this. This is what we should be embarrassed about. If we don't have these things, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. They look at you and say, that's a Christian. I mean, he faced opposition. He looks just like Jesus. In fact, they both look like their father in heaven. There is the resemblance. This father who allows the sun to shine on the good and the evil without any respect of what they said the night before and what all they've done in their past. I thank God that he doesn't treat me based on how my past was because I'd be burning in hell right now. I'm thankful for that. Thankful that God showed me mercy. And I believe that if we've really understood that, we will show mercy to others. So then he says in verse 19, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Forsake all this pulling down and putting down others and making others feel small. Build up one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. 
It doesn't matter if you got it all right. Let's say you held a conviction and the other brother held a different conviction and you get to, listen to this carefully, let's say I hold a conviction and another brother holds a different conviction from mine and we get to eternity and realize that I was right and he was wrong. The thing that would matter, however, at that point was which one of these two pursued the things that made for peace. If he did it, in his wrong conviction, God would justify him. That's how I understand this verse. And me standing there in my right conviction and my right doctrine, refusing to build peace and fellowship with my brother or my sister or my wife or my children or my husband, will be the one, the worse off at the judgment seat of Christ. I am really, really convicted about that and convinced of it in my heart. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. And this is the last thing I have on there. Have it as your conviction before God. That's why I said, if I am okay with, with uh, or let's say I, I'm not okay with playing sports on Sunday, let's say, and I live it as a conviction before God, it doesn't matter if the entire church and all of my friends and my whole family and everybody else around me goes and has a great time watching the football game or playing it. Because I'm having my conviction before God. But the moment I look at that other person and think, man, you know how this comes in, all of these earthly convictions, are, there's so much jealousy in it. I really want to be doing that. My heart is there. I want to be having their conviction, but somehow I think I'm right in this, and, and I'm jealous, and I'm secretly glad when it doesn't go well or if it rains on their Sunday afternoon because they planned the game. You know, those, those kinds of things come up. But if my conviction is before God, says, Lord, this is the conviction you've given me. I'm just going to walk in it. I'm not looking at others and what they look like. Or Think about the issue of dress. Not modesty. It's, we must be modest. That's clear. But in matter of dress and how you should dress and how you, how, you know, can you do this? Is it okay to, to wear that and these type of clothes, skirts, pants, whatever? I says, if you have your conviction, live before God and don't look at the others and how they hold their conviction. And you will be, he says here, happy. It's rarely found in the New Testament. There it is in the middle of verse 22. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God and you'll be happy. You won't be worried about the other person. You won't be judging the other person. You won't be morose and grumbling and complaining about, man, look at everybody else around me. Because your conviction is before God. The moment you live your conviction for the sake of the other person, you will be depressed. You will be grumpy. You will be irritable with that other person because they have a different conviction from you. They have a different conviction from you. Happy is he who does not condemn in himself in what he approves. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at a couple of verses there. Same thing, verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men. No exception. There's that all again. I find over and over and over again. When he talks about peace, he doesn't leave me one out. He doesn't say, okay, as long as you get 99% of the people, it's okay. All men. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. I don't know if I fully understand this verse, but I like how the message is paraphrased it a little bit. Um, listen to it. It's up on there as well. Work at getting along with each other and with God. Otherwise, you'll never get so much as a glimpse of God. Work at getting along with each other and with God, whether it's in the home, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's in the church, whether it's in your community, work at getting along with each other, even those who rub you the wrong way or see things differently from you. Work at that build, bridge building ministry, the ministry of reconciliation that we heard about last week. Work at it. Otherwise, if you don't, if you take it easy and say, uh, yeah, I, my sins are all forgiven, I could care less about the other person. Otherwise, you will not even get a glimpse of God. If you don't pursue, if I don't pursue peace and that sanctification, I'm not even going to get to see God. I might fool myself. The devil would love me to be fooled that I am going to see him one day and I'll get a rude awakening. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now, in the previous verses in 12 and 13, he talks about the same thing of building up. Verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak. Listen, that, that person that's rubbing you the wrong way, that person that's irritable to me has weak knees and weak hands. And I know it would, be, it would make me feel better if I could say exactly the thing that will rub them the wrong way or get at them exactly where I know it is. But do you realize that they have weak knees? The devil's already beat them up. They have weak hands. They've already been beaten up by the devil spiritually perhaps this week. And here I am. I'm going to add to that with what I say and what I do to that person. 
Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet and the feet of others, I think, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Then he says in verse 14, So see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many defiled. And this is how I see that this root of bitterness results in many being defiled. It starts with a little seed, a little seed of suspicion. A little seed of misunderstanding, a little bit of not willing to see from the other's perspective. A little seed. And if I'm not pursuing peace, if I'm not on the alert and watching the devil plant this little seed, because he's the father of all of those seeds, and that's going to determine what kind of fruit I'm going to have in my garden, what kind of a plant is going to come out of it, I watch this seed of suspicion. Because I don't really understand the full picture of what's going on in that person's life or something like that. And a little suspicion comes in. A little misunderstanding. A little miscommunication perhaps. And it comes like a little seed. And I watch it drop and I'm just like, okay, I'll see what happens with it. That's the opposite mentality of pursuing peace. If I'm pursuing peace, I'm going to say, get that out of here. I don't want that seed here. That seed of suspicion against my wife, against my husband, against my brother, my sister, or anybody. I don't want that. Get it out of here. I don't want that seed going down and b bearing fruit in my garden. It's going to destroy my whole garden, my whole life. So the seed, let's say, no, when, when you let it drop, it sinks down. And then it starts to, it's there for a while, and I know it's there. And after a while, it starts to uh, sp uh, sprout roots. And this root system is spreading, this root of bitterness that he says here. It started with a little seed of suspicion and, and mis misunderstanding, miscommunication perhaps. Now it's a root system. I mean, a few years ago, Megan and I were working in our garden and we were trying to till the soil and we realized there was a huge, I mean, multiple root systems under our garden bed that we didn't even know about. It had been there for years, I guess. It was connected to a tree that was a few yards away, a few dozen yards away, but there was the root system all the way over there. And then we started to pull on it and it, it kept going. I mean, I, we pulled quite a chunk of it and then we had to hack at it and then dig out some more and there's still, most of it is still under the garden. We can't do much about it because it's thick. I mean, that, that root system gets real solid and it's, uh, you know, sap flowing through it or whatever it is, the, you know, the tree juices are flowing through it. So it's, it's green. You can't really get at it. You can't just break it off. This is a root system that's entrenched under there, a root of bitterness. And then he says that it starts to spring up. Now this bitterness is there, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pursuing peace, so it's just there. It's sitting underneath, a resentment, a bitterness towards my husband, bitterness towards my wife, bitterness to that other person, that, that other person from my past, perhaps. And it's just sitting there, and all of a sudden it starts to come up like a little shoot, little shoot. Now everybody else can see it too. Now I'm spreading this to other people. My bitterness towards that person, my bitterness towards my wife or towards my husband, I'm sharing it in gossip with other people. It's sprouting up. It's springing up. And look at what the result is. Many are defiled. Many are defiled. A little seed. See how the devil spreads his seed. He plants a little seed in one person's garden, lets a root system develop, and now this is flourished into a tree that's dropping its seeds into everybody else's little land. My dear brother, dear sister, if we're there, let's make sure that we're pursuing peace with all men. And let's not let any other trees drop their seeds in our land either. That's what the devil would love to do. Let it just filter down. Pursue peace. Be on the alert against our relationships, uh, for our relationships. And what the devil would do, especially in marriage, my dear brothers, dear sisters, especially in marriage. I know this. As a married man, I can testify to it. How easy it is for a little seed of misunderstanding and communication to come in. And next thing you know, it's like, what happened to us? I mean, I think that's what, where it ends up in divorce, and that's where it ends up in church splits. Think about it like that. A little, little seed. It started with something so trivial. I think that a good majority of church splits, when we look back at eternity and realize that these differences that we made such a big deal out of, if we had been pursuing peace, if we had been vigilant over our garden and says, I am not going to let that plant here in my soil. No way. Father, give me grace. Not, not here, not in my garden. I don't want any of that. So much more healing could have happened in marriage relationships. And my dear brothers, dear sisters, it's not too late. I believe with all of my heart. It's never too late. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation. He yearns for you. One more verse, Romans chapter 16. Verse 20. You know that God is going to crush Satan. Under, he's going to just completely destroy him. But you know that in that destroying, he's still going to be completely at peace. 
God's not going to get worked up. God's not going to get the secret delight that people in this world get at just giving their enemy a good whack. God's going to do that. He's going to utterly destroy Satan for all eternity. But he's going to be completely at peace. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. Soon. It's coming soon. And the devil knows it too. And the de God's not worked up about it. God's not worked up about the fact that the devil is still wreaks havoc on, in, in the world today and causes so much confusion. He's not worked up about it. He's a God of peace. And he knows one day he's waiting his time. One day it'll just happen like that. And he, God won't lose his peace over that. Because he is peace. It is the fruit of his Holy Spirit. But you know whose feet he's going to crush Satan under? It says our feet. These sons and daughters of God who are peacemakers, who are peace pursuers. He sees, there's a peace pursuer of mine. Good. I can crush Satan under that person's feet. I can crush that seed that's going to come in and, and uh, wreak havoc. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Under the feet of his sons and daughters, the peace pursuers, those who have made it their goal, they have determined that I'm not going to put a stumbling block in front of my brother. I'm going to pursue everything that makes for peace. Don't let Satan get a foothold in your marriage, your children, your home, your church life. Be a peace pursuer. If you see it coming, don't let it happen. Be a peace pursuer. Be on the alert. Watch for those little seeds, those little suspicious thoughts, those little motives, those little attitudes, those little uh, uncertainties, those little lacks of knowledge that when the devil, if it goes down underground, it becomes even more difficult. The longer you let it sit underground, under, uh, in your heart, that root of bitterness, the more it'll spread. And the more difficult it will be to deal with it later on, better that you deal with it right away when you see that little seed coming, dropping out of the air. That little thought, that little circumstance where you don't really know why they did that, why he said that, or why he wrote that about me, or why she did that, or whatever. I don't understand it, but it's a little suspicious thought. And the devil will try to take advantage of it. Be a peace pursuer. Now, I, I want to say this in closing, that this is not, like I said, this is not Nobel peace. This is divine peace. This is a peace that we cannot manufacture. I could try and try and try and try and try to be at peace with my wife and be at peace with my husband, be at peace with that other person. It will not last. If I'm still living in this kingdom of darkness, if I'm still a child of this darkness, it'll never work. I need the Holy Spirit. I need divine peace. If I am to look like my Father in heaven, if I am to become and to resemble Him, I must have His Holy Spirit giving me His peace. And I know very often a, a, an artificial piece, I can manufacture an artificial piece, like a patchwork. You know, instead of building a bridge, I'm just going to patch up things. We'll just patch things up. It's a phrase they use in relationship. We'll just patch it up and go on. It's not really peace, because the peace of the Holy Spirit comes from the cross, where I deny myself. You can patch things up quite well with somebody and never really have to die. Phil preached on that last week. It takes a cross. If you want to experience the ministry of reconciliation, if I want to experience that ministry of reconciliation in my life, I must die. But myself, because he's very smart, will find a shortcut to not have to hang on the cross and patch things up. And we'll go on our many, merry way for a few years. And then it will come up again. You know what the problem is? Self has not died. There's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament where when, when God sent the fire of the Holy Spirit, a picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Every piece of the animal must, be, must have been cut, cut up and chopped up there. And when the last piece was put on there, boom, fire came. You couldn't manufacture it. You couldn't you know, use a light or anything like that. This was fire from heaven. But God waited till the last piece of the animal was cut up, chopped up, placed on the altar, and the fire came. And this is a picture of the fire of peace that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you and I, my dear brothers and sisters, desire the baptism in the Holy Spirit for this? That God will light a fire inside of me that I will pursue peace with whoever it is. Whoever that person is from my past or whatever the difference in personality I have with somebody else. I have been so filled with the Holy Spirit that I'm going to pursue peace. And God is going to send down his fire because I've laid all on the altar. All myself, all my ambitions, all my reputation. I don't care what people think about me, whether I'm right or wrong. I don't, I'm not going to try to convince them about anything. I want the Holy Spirit's fire and that fire of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is peace, to to drive me to pursue peace with all men and all women. As far as it lies with you, live at peace with all men. Blessed are the peace pursuers. They shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you called us to a real way of peace, Lord, and you long to build relationships in us, to see relationships flourish within us, Lord, where all these other things that can come in will, will be burned up by the Holy Spirit. 
Make us peace pursuers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.